good. I'm good. I'm getting there. I feel like there's, you know, like light again, you know? And for, for everyone listening, this is because you have been through the entire process of startup to investment, to selling a business, to now starting up again. So um, you were saying the other day that you felt like you were down the bottom again, you know, totally. moving up again. So let me introduce you properly. And I'm yep. going to read through this because even though I've known you since school, um, you know, I don't want to downplay your achievements. So best <laughs> that I, I read them out. So Rebecca Lau Marsh, nay, Rebecca Lau, is a stylist and entrepreneur now, you created two disruptive businesses in the e-commerce and fashion industries, which I'm going to get you to talk about, mm-hmm. Bosch Celebrity Fashion and White Runway. And as I said before, you're one of the rare entrepreneurs that's been able to experience not only the startup phase, but its ultimate um, uh, sort of the ability to sell that business and then move on to the next project. Um, so let's start for everyone that's listening. Give, give us an, a sort of a bit brief background on the first two businesses to where you are now. Okay, cool. So I started my first online um, commerce store, which is what you talked about, gosh, um, back in 2007. And so when I started, I actually came back from the UK. Um, I was in a sales job and I used to hit my targets and be like twiddling my thumbs thinking, what the hell do I do? Sit at my desk and do some online shopping, as you do. (laughs) And then I came back to Australia and there was just nothing out there. Um, and so that's when I thought, you know, I'd come up with Gosh. Um, I love, you know, magazines and uh, seeing, you know, what Misha Bartom wore and then, you know, how to sort of recreate that look. And I thought I should do that, but also sell it. Um, I was really good at sort of styling outfits for girlfriends and all that sort of stuff. And so it was pretty much just doing the same old thing, but doing it on a website. Mm-hmm. and making it easy for people to be able to purchase those items that you sort of see in a collage in a magazine. Um, and so Gosh sort of took off. It was such a new concept. It was allowing everyday Australians to be able to look a million bucks without paying, you know, that amount. Um, and so that did really well for me. And then I saw a bit of a gap in the market for evening wear. Um, and that's because I started sort of, you know, as you do trial and error, and I noticed that a lot of people were purchasing evening gowns. Um, and I thought, this is great. So I contacted a couple of customers and sort of said, oh, you've just purchased, you know, three or four of the same gown in different um, sizes. And they sort of said, yeah, you know, we've been looking for bridesmaid dresses, which aren't, which don't cost a bomb, that look great, they're modern. Um, and so I really researched and I thought, you know what, bridesmaid fashion has not changed in the last however many decades, it was all that sort of strapless chiffon satiny type of thing. Um, And that's why I thought, you know, there's a real opportunity here to sort of disrupt the market, um, come out with bridesmaid dresses that have an accessible price point. Um, That's not a complete waste of money that you'd be able to wear again. And you actually look great while you're wearing them. Mm. Um, I was a bridesmaid for a friend and I was in this strapless chiffon lilac you know, little number. And I thought, oh my God, I would not be seen dead wearing this anywhere. But here I am with 400 people, you know, MC (laughs) for my best friend's wedding, you know? Um, So yeah, so that's my runway. Um, And a couple of things. Firstly, Rebecca, could you please put your pen down? Because I can- Oh, sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Picking away. Yep. Number two, Um, one of them- I feel like the naughty student. Well, I've just taken us back to year 10. Um, <laughs> totally. Yes, so, miss. Yeah. Um, so um, a couple of things that I think are really important for everyone listening to understand. Number one, gosh, celebrity fashion. 2007 in Australia in the fashion industry, this was a huge innovation. And um, that because it was, really was the birth of that fast fashion online e-com space. So the fact mm-hmm. that you were at the forefront of that is amazing. Then when you um, sort of sidestepped into White Runway and you sort mm. of carved out a new niche, not only were you modernising that niche, that segment, but I remember chatting to you at the time and you were like, oh, babes, I'm just going to introduce this thing where you can change the length or the size or the colour or whatever, which was ultimately the birth of customization and personalization, mm-hmm. which yes. every single marketing conference in the world talks about how brands are always looking for ways to customise and personalise. But you were, again, at the forefront of that, including your size range. So let's just mm. say more words about that. Right. So we were the first ones, I think, to make it um 
accessible for people to be able to customise certain parts of their dress without having to pay for a seamstress to come in and redesign the whole thing. Um, we offered sizes, you know, four through to 24 because, come on, like, you know, majority of sizes that you buy off the rack are only your six to 18 and then the fits are usually modelled on a size eight, you know, six foot model. Um, and so that didn't really make sense for that white runway customer. And so we had them... Um, we had uh, additional customizations that they could make to the dress. We'd have your standard sort of dress, but then if you were extra tall, you could add length. If you wanted to cover your arms, you could add sleeves. So we really worked with our designers to sort of say, hold on, you know, we are off the rack, but we want to be able to make some adjustments. Um, and the wedding industry being, you know, usually they're, they're waiting for three to six months for their product or, or orders and all that sort of stuff. The customer is attuned to sort of waiting that time. Um, so that allowed us to provide them with those customizations um, mm. and make it feasible for us commercially as well. And so you um, sold that business, didn't you, in what, 2007, 15, was it? Yeah, 2015. So uh, we were predominantly online and then uh, after speaking to our customers and there's this constant communication with the customer and trying to understand what works best for them. Um, and you've sort of also got to feel to that noise. I think it's really, really important to speak to your customers, but everyone you speak to has a slightly different opinion and you can't listen to everyone. But you sort of filter through and you sort of think, okay, this makes sense, I understand that. And so um, originally being online we then uh, built showrooms um, so we had one in Sydney one in Melbourne and then eventually Brisbane and then New York um, and that really allowed us to uh, welcome that customer into our rooms and also let us learn from the customer um, and also train our stylists in-house on how to address certain body shapes. Yes, and that's a huge thing. I think um, one of the great things about you providing the extensive size range is mm. um, <laughs> A bridal party is, has got to be one of the most um, common um, cross sections of, of the market where you get people mm -hmm. of all shapes and sizes and you all want us to wear a bloody lilac chiffon dress. It's just not going to work. So I remember for you guys having that opportunity to either have a style or a colorway that could be modified to suit everyone was great. And mm. for the stylists that were in your showrooms providing that mm. styling service, um, was that, do you think the customization was a major um, draw card for these bridal parties that would come in and with everyone, their own, their own sort of host of body issues and, mm. and confidence? I think there were two things. Number one, when we looked at ordering, when we sort of curated the range of dresses that we offered, we always made sure um, that the dresses were flattering had a flattering fit regardless of what sort of size range they were. You know, there were some absolute um, styles that we did not stock, which is, you know, your satin strapless type of A-line frock that didn't really look good um, on, on some body shapes. But um, as a general rule, we sort of, whenever we bring in dresses or curate dresses for the collection that we sell, we ensure that we have the size range and that they're going to be flattering in those mm. styles. Um, and then, and then two, yes, the stylist came through and they would be able to um, offer those customers who wanted, say, for example, to cover up their arms. You know, sometimes the, they love the dress on their figure, but they just didn't like it because it showed too much arm. Or then we had, um, you know, customers who might have been a religious, they might have been Muslim or any other religion which required them to have long sleeves. Um, and so we didn't want to say sort of, oh, sorry, you know, go get your own matching item to go with the dress. We wanted to offer that customization in the same fabric. Yeah. Um, but that really opened up uh, the opportunities for all different types of women, shapes, sizes, race, colour, you know, religion to yeah. be able to look uh, great in our dresses. And I think the reason why I wanted to chat with you, aside from mm. obviously just loving chatting with you, is I, I know having seen, having watched from the sidelines, you building these two businesses and now the three new businesses that you're running, Love My Baby, which is Australian made baby gift boxes, 21 mm -hmm. Scrubs, which is fashionable medical scrubs and Kitten Cradle, which is Australian made 100% organic cotton baby wear. And you've got children, Jesus Christ, I don't know how you're doing it. But my point is this, yeah. I also know that you have started all of this without wealthy family mm. without investors without capital and you've mm. had to build everything from the grassroots ground up you've had to be scrappy and you've had to hustle so what I thought we'd do today is kind of 
drill down into the PR side of things, how mm -hmm. you were able to make these fashion businesses a success is, I guess, one mm -hmm. of the one of the ingredients is getting PR yeah. coverage. Yeah. And I know that you didn't start out as a stylist, but it seems that by pitching yourself as a stylist when you were trying to get PR coverage, it ended mm -hmm. up working for you. Um, mm -hmm. So we just want to hear all of your insights and uh, and maybe learn a couple of things. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think. Um, you know, we, we used to work together in the past, Sarah, um, when you were doing PR and that we and did. what I was gonna say. Yeah. <laughs> and that really helped me out a lot. Um, I think throughout the years of you know uh, working in, in fashion and e-com, PR is super important for the brand. Otherwise, you know, you're paying thousands of dollars to try and get placements or advertising and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, for the, the businesses that I've had and do have, I'm constantly thinking of new angles to be able to pitch. Um, some of the things that I do is, is, you know, I'll get into, obviously you're not in that pitch frame of mind all the time, but there are certain times in, in the year that I sit down and I sort of go, okay, we need to make something newsworthy. How can we get out there? Yeah. Um, and so most recently with the 21 Scrubs, which is the medical, stylish medical apparel range, um, I, I put my PR hat on and thought, okay, what would be interesting for journalists to write about? And so I started looking up journalists and started reading the stories that they wrote. Um, and then I sort of had a look at what was going on recently um, in the world. And we just had Australian Fashion Week. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, well, this is a good time. I obviously don't want to hit them up leading up to Fashion Week and I don't want to hit them up during Fashion Week because they've got plenty of stories to write about then. So I'll wait till the week after Fashion Week where they're sort of chilled out and then looking for new stories to write. Mm -hmm. um, and then I started getting inspired by a lot of the stories that they wrote and thought, how can I spin this so that I can give them a similar angle? Mm -hmm. um, I came across a story where it's actually one of my friends where he used to work in military and he uh, has started working in women's fashion and he sort of made the change from military to runway. Mm -hmm. uh, he recently uh, debuted at Australian Fashion Week. And I thought, okay, well, that's a really interesting angle. Obviously, editors do like this. And that's when I sat down and thought, okay, well, I came from, you know, styling or sending dresses over to Eva Longoria, Jeannie Mai, um, Erin Holland, Sophie Monk, and all these ladies. And now here I am sort of styling surgeons and vets and, and so forth. It's pretty comical yeah. <laughs> um and so then I thought of the headline you know from fashion frocks to surgical scrubs or you know um a move from red carpet to fashion in the operating theater so trying to think of those fun headlines my favorite that are very what's, the, what's your headline the other one I read was something something but make it fashion surgery but make it fashion <laughs> Just, I love, oh, I, I love and, it so much. And you know, this is, guys, this is something I want you all to understand. Beck, you've sold businesses. You've had showrooms in New York. Like we're not mucking around here. You've had incredible business success. And yet it's still you banging away at the computer, creating this yeah. stuff. The article I read recently in the Daily Mail about 21 Scrubs, and I said to you, what a great article. And you wrote, well, I fucking wrote the whole thing. And that, <laughs> that's the important thing to remember that, you know, that sort of taking charge, create, making the job as easy as possible for the journalist and writing yeah. as if the article is already written, I think mm. is a really important point, right? Absolutely. It's making it as easy. I mean, I, I wrote the basis of it, but then obviously the editor does her magic and she makes it all beautiful and easy to read because obviously I'm not a journalist. I'm not a great writer, but I'll try really hard. Um, <laughs> and so it's about making it really easy for someone to pick up your article and be able to read through it very easily and, and sort of edit where necessary and pop it out there. I mean, these guys are super busy. They've got deadlines to run. They're constantly getting emails. Um, they're constantly getting pictures. And so to make it as easy as possible for them by, you know, creating a couple of fun headlines that are relevant to the stories that they're writing, which are relevant to the current environment, mm -hmm. um, and, and sort of making it really easy for them to go, okay, yep, great, copy and paste, edit edit bits and pieces, add a couple of images, and here we go. Because so, for, for most, for a lot of personal stylists that want to um, build their brand awareness um, and their audience, their reach, they, they, they understand the benefit of contributing to online publications, um, print, if it still exists, you know, it would be great, but, but essentially online publications. And... So I think the natural approach normally is to go, okay, what's happening at the moment? It's a change of season. So I'll, mm -hmm. maybe I'll pitch that I can, you know, do a trend report, which mm. I'd imagine every stylist in the free world is also thinking the same thing. So yes. 
is your advice to really, is your advice, I, I know, our advice would yes. be um, to flavour that up with relevance, with, I guess, what, Absolutely. Say, what do you reckon? Yep. Absolutely. So say, for example, um, what's happening right now? Um, what's in the news? What's been in the, uh, Johnny Depp, Amber Heard? Um, okay, so it could be, I mean, we're not seeing a lot of her fashion. She's quite boring, actually, when she goes to court. But it could be things like, you know, get the jailbird or, you know, <laughs> how, to, how to look innocent or, you know, the whole... Um, <laughs> Inventing Anna, you know, they, they're going to court and having this particular look about them. Oh it could God. be a whole styling session on that. That is piss funny. How to get, to get out of jail outfit. Courtroom couture. Courtroom couture. I love that. You. you know, it could be about that because everyone's obsessed with Amber Heard and Johnny Depp and what's happening right now with their court case. Yes. It could be, yeah, yes. so anything that's sort of relevant. And if I think back to, okay, what else is news right now? Um, that's um, not sad. That's not sad. That's not to do with bloody politics. I was just going to say an election, um, yeah. war, uh, yeah. COVID. Do you know what? Uh, something that I think is always relevant because it's my passion is the current state of retail. What yep. you know? Okay. What's what's happening mm-hmm. in the retail landscape? Um, Absolutely. Live, in, yes. In live yes. shopping. Massive yeah. one. TikTok. And I was just talking to a friend this morning about fast fashion because we just found out um, one of the fast fashion stores has gone into liquidation. Uh, I think it's misguided. So misguided has gone into mm. administration. Um, and so we were like, wow, in shock. But at the same time, I also felt like fast fashion was eventually sort of going to slow down and come to an end. I think the majority of consumers now are very conscious about the environment and the impact that we can make Um in the world and fast fashion creates so much so much junk um, and so much pollution so much goes to landfill and so I think there is this move towards um, sustainable fashion sustainable exactly and this is why I'm doing the baby range which is organic cotton and sustainable and, and so forth but yes I think um, you know with with what's going on at the moment you know if we're talking about fast fashion and misguided made headlines you know today about it going into administration you could then pitch sustainable and eco-friendly clothing options, you know, or yes. so really yes. tweaking that, being able to bring current uh, relevant news items into your uh, your pitch would make it so much easier for, for I think, journalists to pick up. I completely agree. Now, mm. um, tell me about TV pitching mm. because we can argue the benefits of TV versus online, yes. you know, um, the return on investment, but I know that you used to do a lot and you still do a lot of TV appearances. Mm. Um, producers are always being pitched segments. Any tips for pitching yourself again, but from a TV perspective? Yeah. From a TV perspective, they sort of need a little bit more beef for their stories. Mm-hmm. I feel like, um, you know, there needs to be a bit more depth. It needs to be, sort of like a little production in a way if you were to be able to get yourself online Um, and I mean on on TV and I used to be able to do things like um, talk about the the latest fashion or or what celebrities are wearing and so forth there's less of an interest in that now it's more about um, you know the last one of the um, episodes that I did with the morning show was about this is a while ago the rise of the online bride you know, and how easy it was for people to be able to swipe left and right to meet their partner and then how easy it is to be able to get online and purchase your dress and your bridesmaid's dresses and order everything basically for the wedding. And so you just need to rock up. Um, And then, you know, brought in some examples or clients who could be my example of the online bride and you know they discussed everything that they did online and the advantages and disadvantages and so forth and again it's sort of like putting on that producer's hat um, just as you'd put on a journalist's hat yeah. put on that producer's hat and sort of think okay how do I make this story um, uh, a big? full segment so you're essentially exactly. you're creating your own segment and yes. um, for the purposes of comedy, are you reenacting yes. that seg- that segment and recording it and sending almost like an audition segment? <laughs> <laughs> Not so much. It's still a pitch by a um, you know email usually. I, I just want to clarify. I obviously know the answer to that question. I just thought it would be as funny as an. I was just although, imagining although, you being like. To be honest, I action. think that would be so much fun. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> 
exactly. I'm just always thinking of what's going to make me laugh. And you but, know what? But, and that might be the way to cut through these days. I mean, how boring if you're constantly just getting emails and having to trawl through them. If you just got like this video that popped up, even if it was like a three second GIF or something of yourself doing something funny and then with sort of text around it, it could work. Exactly. But the I I guess the, 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 the big piece of information here is that when you're pitching to TV, um, which, and I, I know a lot of my clients or, um, and clients I've worked with in the past, well, say to me, I want to get on TV. I want to pitch, you know, that I sort of talk about X, Y, Z. This missing piece of the puzzle that you're saying is you've actually got to flesh that out. So it's not yeah. just I'm going to offer my opinion. It's this is the concept for the segment with a beginning, middle and an end or an arc. Mm-hmm. You know, um, maybe you're bringing in supporting cast, like as you said, you know, yes. um, people like your pretend girlfriend. Yeah, uh-huh. your girlfriend. Exactly. Um, mm-hmm. But you're actually fleshing out a little tableau, a little a little segment, a little scene like you would be um, producing your own TV show. And I think it would be really handy if you sort of pick a niche to be um, mm. sort of an expert in. Mm. So if you're a stylist, obviously you can style, you know, numerous body shapes, people and so forth. But if you picked a niche, for example, styling curvy women or um, a niche, you know, the best denim sort of expert stylist um a niche where it's you know I think it would sort of make you stand out from the crowd if you had a particular niche um and when a relevant story came along they would think of that person straight away speaking of niches sustainability is obviously um Mm -hmm. coming more and more to the forefront it's impacting the retail industry so for stylists that over the last few years have referred to themselves as a, you know, a sustainability stylist or a stylist that's um, interested in conscious fashion. And Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's now a need to diversify or to sort of specialise even more as that word becomes, um, you know, it's a little bit like how people all call themselves a keynote speaker, you know, these days. Like if everyone's a bloody keynote speaker, then who the fuck are the, who who else, who is starting (laughs) Do you know what I mean? It makes no sense. If we're all saying keynote speaker, if we're all saying sustainable, if we're all saying personal stylist, how do you stand out? So would you recommend even niching down within the, let's say that sustainability angle? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, in the sustainability angle, it could be new clothes. Um, You know, you're you're, um, the expert in finding brands that specialise in sustainable clothing you could be an upcycle stylist where you go into people's houses and then you redo and help them restyle their outfits and bring new life to them you know um so I think definitely sort of honing in on a niche and being able to shout about your niche is the best way that you're going to be able to get any press or PR about you and just sort of extending that brainstorm storm even further um maybe once you've worked out your niche let's say you're going to be the upcycling expert then mm. fleshing out a little mini TV segment which mm-hmm. presents a problem and a solution um, is, is really not only a fantastic exercise because it will help you get that PR coverage, but it keeps mm. you in that marketing mindset of this is, this is what I specialise in, this is why people should work mm. with me, and it's, it keeps you on message, I think. Don't you reckon? Yeah, Otherwise absolutely. we sort of fall into a more generalised space where we're just rehashing the same sort of sentiments. Yeah. And it's so easy these days to create those sort of reels and videos. You can be your own video editor with your phone. So there's no reason why you shouldn't be recording as much content as possible and using that content to do your advertising and so forth. Um, you know, mm-hmm. your, your customers who are looking to sort of upcycle really want to be able to see why you're better than anyone else. And if you're the stylist who's got that content and you're doing the before and afters and you've got all of that, then you build that trust. Um, Mm. and you build the confidence that the customer will have in you and they're intrigued and they want to see what you can do with their wardrobe. Um, Mm. So I definitely think, you know, being a stylist, I mean, it's it's super busy being your own business owner. You're wearing so many hats and you've got so many things to do. It's kind of like, where do you start? You're creating content. You're trying to pitch yourself. You're doing day to day. Then you're meeting up with clients. So I think um, for me, what's been really good, obviously, is is setting out your calendar and having your social social calendars. So it might be every three months that you put on your PR hat or mm-hmm. your content hat and you start really spending sort of a week every three months thinking about new angles and then having the next three months to sort of work on them, pitch them and so forth, and then come back to a fresh one every three months. Um, I think that's, that's been really good for me, uh, mm-hmm. you know, to have that constant reminder to, oh, hold on, I need to think of an angle. Oh, hold on, we need some PR here or there. 
So speaking of um, cycles and timelines then, if you've sent a pitch hmm. um, and you don't get anything back from it, what what did you normally do? Did you wait a few weeks and then touch base again? Did you feel awkward? How did you manage that process? Because I'm hoping that we, we don't just give up. That no, we don't. Yeah. 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 Usually I wait uh, a week and a half, um, give them time to digest the information. And then I just send a really quick follow up and say, hey, um, just wanted to see whether you were interested in running this particular story. And I put the headline, I might tweak the headline a bit, little bit because that might be you know, that might be favoured more than the one I originally sent. Um, and then I said, if, if you're not interested in this particular story, we'd love to know what you're currently working on um, or would love to be added to your call list in the future. And they could easily come back and say, um, sorry, not what I'm working on right now, but we'll add you to the call list. And great, then, then hopefully they'll be in contact with you later on. But at least you've had that conversation. Mm. I think, um, but definitely not be annoying and, you know, email every, every week or so because then you'll be blocked. But definitely a nice, you know, how are you going? Just making sure that you received the press release. You can also add, um, you know, a mail reader, you know, those email readers that you can tag along on your on your Gmail so that you know that it's actually reached that person and they've actually read it and you can tell what time they read it and when they read it and so how many times they opened your email. It's a bit stalkerish, but those sort of things help when you want to know uh, to make sure that it hasn't gone to junk mail because often it can go directly into junk mail. Um, yeah. Yeah, having things like that sort of help you and, and kind of go, okay, well, she read my email two days ago. I might make contact today and mm. sort of see where we're at. But I definitely think follow-up and building up that relationship is really important. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. Starting as we as we all did at the very beginning when you start in PR or media and building relationships, you know, back in the good old days of the old corporate lunch, you know, yeah. where you'd be just taking people for lunches, you're building up that sort of friendship and then you're learning more about them and then you go in for the pitch yeah. um, <laughs> helps. And I think that's probably an element that we forget that mm. these people um, that are being bombarded from every PR agency and every brand around the world um, ultimately go back to the people they trust and that they rely on. So if yeah. you prioritise making a connection first, potentially with your top 10 media mm -hmm. contacts and then what, you know, once you've built up that connection, starting to send those pitches through, that might be an idea. Absolutely. And I think um, we've got the luxury of, you know, being able to track them down on social media these days. And so prior so to sending true. that story, you know, go and have a look at their Twitter, go and have a look at their I Instagram. I see you're in your bedroom watching personal... Netflix. Hello. Too much. I too much Google Google yeah. exactly. I've got the coordinates of the Vogue editor. You know, okay. Do a mini talk. I know which coffee shop she visits every Monday morning. Yeah. But um, yeah, go and do a little bit of stalking and have a look at what their interests are. A lot of them have Twitter accounts and you can see they've reposted a lot of their stories or they retweet things that they really like. Um, get an understanding of who they are, jump onto their Instagram, see what their passions are, and then sort of try and connect that way. So you're not just sending... And then catfish them. No, just joking. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. But, I mean, you know, you want to, just like a potential date, like if you meet someone online, you want to Google them and you want to see what their interests are, you want to see who their friends are, you want to see if they've got a dog or a cat, what sort of common interests you might have, right? <laughs> I mean, I've been out of the dating world for a while, I but say, I assume that's what most no, people would do. No, I don't think that, I, I can only assume that that is not what we do, although maybe it is because both of you and I found, um, met our that's husbands. It. We've been attached. For so long and in the but I would totally world. assume you would do a social stalk so make sure before you do all your pictures and so forth find out who you want to pitch to do a bit of social stalk find out their interests find out whether they're going to to like you and so forth you might want to follow them you might want to like a couple of their posts you might want to respond <laughs> to a couple of things but make sure I will hopefully you have that sort of um gauge whether you're being stalkerish or not because you definitely don't <laughs> want to be annoying but if you've already made a couple of connections with them on social or liked a couple of their things and done a bit, a bit of a research, I, I feel like um, with, you know, I think four or five touch points, you sort of start, you know, getting a bit more familiar with that, with that editor. You do. And I mean, one could argue if we were to take an existential perspective that you're mm. manifesting that contact because you're bringing yeah. that energy in, you know, whichever way yeah. you want to look at it. It mm. seems like focusing on the relationship and then mm. making sure that what, once you've once you've started to build that relationship, you'll intrinsically know how to pitch an idea in. Uh, because, again, uh, in my sort of PR experience and in yours, 
Mm. You do want to tailor your stories and your pitch and your angle yes. to mm. each mm. publication because yes. they're not all the same. Mm. So if you know who you're talking to, then you kind of know, oh, do you know what? I know this person actually really, this is, these are some of the values that drive their writing or exactly. I know this publication's audience are really more focused on the dollar saved, you know. So and that's, that's exactly, and, and if you sort of, you do the same for your client, right? If you had styling clients, you do the same. You act a certain way or you'll select particular brands because of that particular client. You'll select certain styles because you know that client, you know, it, seems to like that kind of look a bit more so just as you would a client tailor clothing um and your services to them you, you're just pretty much doing the same um yeah. with editors and journalists and so forth that you're pitching to Beck, this mm. has been so great thank you so much for sharing these insights and i i want to say that the stuff that you have shared with us it works because that has been the backbone of your success time and time again had you just completely outsourced all of your PR, you know, for the last 15, 20 years, I wouldn't be asking your opinion. But <laughs> <laughs> you've actually done this yourself. Um, and that hustle and that strategy of just playing it really, really smart has paid dividends. So I'm hoping that everyone listening tries out a few of these ideas. Thank you mm. again, my love, for your time. Such a pleasure. It's always great to chat to you.